February 13th as part of our Forum on Contemporary Values series. Um, she'll be interviewed by another author, uh, Rabbi Joseph Telushkin, and our 92nd Street Y scholar in residence, Rabbi David Wozniak. So there are still a few tickets left for that. It's next Wednesday. Um, and of course, our final session for this year of the Literary Exchange, uh, award-winning author Carol Glickfeld will be with us to discuss her book, Swimming Towards the Ocean. It's a terrific book. If you haven't read it, go out and get it, and then join us here. It's going to be Wednesday, March 20th. Um, and now for tonight, we are very pleased to welcome back Dr. Margot Krebs, <coughs> our facilitator for the series. Um, and we are honored to have Ann Royk be with us tonight, um, of course, the author of 1185 Park Avenue. She was with us just about this time last year, I think, for a program on the future of American Jewry. Mm -hmm. um, and we are really honored to have you back tonight. Um, Ms. Royfi is going to have a new book published this April. Um, the title is Marriage, a Fine Predicament, and it will be out this April by Basic Books. Thank you for joining us, and enjoy the evening. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are very pleased tonight to meet Anne Royfi. I was just saying that I had the pleasure of hearing her a number of years ago in uh, Wayne, New Jersey at the Y. And it's certainly a pleasure to meet with you personally. Uh, the story, 1185 Park Avenue, the memoir, opens in 1931. And as one uh, critic noted, it is a social history as well as a personal one. The memoirist, of course, offers us a single lens, but it is sometimes a very penetrating and unique vision, and sometimes a painful one. Chapter one of this memoir, um, I'd like to refer to that right away because it impressed me very much. Chapter one ends this way. Eugene and Blanche Roth, your parents, lived at 1185 Park Avenue in New York City all during the Depression, when wind and dust drove farmers to leave their homes and migrate to the edge of America, and workers sold apples on street corners and banks closed, and even the gangsters met with hard times. But don't forget poor King Midas, who couldn't taste the juice of one sweet pear. Somewhere else in America, a Saturday evening post Norman Rockwell child was baiting his safety pin hook with a worm and leaning over a brook. He had a big golden dog by his side and a fishing pole made from a whittled down branch of a tree. He intended to bring a fish home for dinner. The wistful tone of this passage is characteristic of this memoir, I think, which is the story of a mother and a father and two siblings who live in the lap of luxury, yearning for emotional fulfillment that unfortunately they can't bring to one another. Eugene and Blanche Roth married for all the wrong reasons, we are told. She, because he was so handsome and she insecure. He, because he was, she was so rich and he was escaping from a poor immigrant background. Blanche's grandfather founded the Phillips Van Heusen Shirt Company, an empire that originated in a pushcart. Eugene came to America with his penniless family, but rejecting his past, succeeded in going to law school and marrying an heiress. And in fact, he was not only a self-made man, but a man who created himself in his own image of a successful, polished American. 1185 Park Avenue, we are told, was an address permitted to wealthy Jews. Farther downtown was the preserve of their Anglo-Saxon counterparts. And I'd like to read, if you have the book here, it's on page uh, five. <clears throat> if society is a pyramid in which the top comes to a point, they were the point. They did not so much cast a shadow over the rest as provide a source of constant anxiety for the others. That is the place where you weren't wanted. That is the restricted hotel on this block. That is the hospital that doesn't allow Jewish doctors to admit patients. That is the school you won't bother to apply to. 
Them was the word spoken with a touch of awe and a spark of anger. Who are they really to think they own the world and are so much better than us? The big businesses, the big banks, the big fortunes, the big givers to charity, the big owners of boxes at the opera, all of them were them. They didn't want us. Who cared? In America, who cared? And besides, one could imitate them, or at least try. Downtown, you could ride there in a double-decker bus on Fifth Avenue or take the Third Avenue L at the end of the 1930s in New York. There were communists endlessly arguing on campuses and German intellectuals at the new school and socialists with stars in their eyes and a grim set to their lips. There were artists in Greenwich Village drinking and brawling. Edna St. Vincent Millay was burning her candle at both ends. The unions were building apartments for their workers over in the West Twenties, and union organizers shouted from soapboxes in Bryant Park behind the 42nd Street Library. Uptown, there were jazz clubs in Harlem and across the bridge, Irish pubs and Italian clubs in Queens. On our Park Avenue, the men wore fedoras and left the house each day with a clean white cotton handkerchief in their breast pocket. The women wore hats and veils and Chanel suits and tight corsets, and their silk stockings were held up by garter belts that left raw red marks on the upper thigh. They played mahjong on card tables fitted with a green velvet cloth. Their jewelry was gold. Their coats were mink. They lunched at the plaza. They drank martinis after 5 o'clock. And on Saturdays, they hopped in their cars and played a round of golf at their clubs in Westchester or New Jersey. So it is in this world that two children are raised, one, a little girl who is extremely resourceful and who seems to learn early to fend for herself. And Eugene Jr., or Johnny as the family called him, a sickly child. As Anne grows, her relationship with Blanche is that of confidant and attendant to a chronically depressed and basically ineffective mother. Her father, on the other hand, is her first and true love, and everything she does is aimed to please him. I think you're writing about growing up female, the need to please colors who we become, and the one who determines who we're going to become begins as the father and ends up, his role becomes all the male figures in our lives. And you say, there is no love like the first love. Everything after is a mere ripple wider than the initial act, but ever lessening in, in, but never lessening in intensity. Uh, page 179, <coughs> what it is like or what it was like to grow up female. I faint toward a Jewish path. My brother continues down his. All that spring, I spent hours in the Metropolitan <coughs> Museum of Art. I'm not looking at the paintings, which are fine enough, but not what I am seeking. I had decided that if I were an Israeli soldier on leave, I might come to New York and go to the museum, and walking the halls and feeling lonely, I might be happy to meet an American girl. <laughs> it occurred to me that such a soldier, a veteran of 48, a fighter pilot perhaps, might ask me to be his wife and take me to Israel with him and I would grow tomatoes in the desert and drive a tractor. I already know how to steer a speedboat. I walk the halls of the museum and sit on the benches in all the galleries, but I never meet an Israeli soldier. In fact, no one talks to me. No use scolding me now for the peculiar form of passivity this pre-feminist vigil exposes. I was forming an escape rope out of whatever remnants of material I had, if another train was coming down the tracks, it was still too far away for me to hear its whistle. And even if I lay down and put my ear to the ground, I would have heard nothing more than the sound of my own breathing. I find this especially moving, even more so than in this passage, um, in your uh, confession regarding your first marriage. I'd like to read from that, if I may. I married so that the artist male could absorb me, grant me by association a pass into the holy light of creation, cathedrals and unstained national flags, 
I made of art too much. It became my golden calf. I was willing to sacrifice my, night, my not quite virgin self on its altar. That was my love for Paul, or most of it. He's not like my father, I said to myself. He has language, poetry. I have a lame excuse. A female in 1957 had been quite conditioned to express her ambitions through a male. Girls who wanted to be doctors married one. Girls who wanted to be politicians married one. My excuse is that I thought that art, art as I worshipped it, as it gave meaning to my life, was male, not female. And I would need a male if I were to get close to the sacred fire. The leaking hole in this excuse is that Amelia Earhart did not marry a Saint-Exupéry and wave him off from distant runways. Madame Curie did not marry Louis Pasteur and cook him chicken soup. I drowned where others swam quite competently. I thought myself special. I was ordinary, dangerously ordinary. Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask you to comment on those views of feminism? Well, let's start with the last one and work our way back. Uh, ordinary because that was the zeitgeist. Mm. And it is impossible for my children, for many of you here, to imagine how strong that was. If I were to suggest to you, men and women here, that you uh, are going to, in f six years, take off all your clothes and walk naked through the streets in the summer because that will be the custom. You, will be, you would be as amused and surprised and shocked as I was to discover, to have my world change um, to what is what really quite normal now. Um, there are women lawyers, there are women doctors, there are women everywhere in banks, in, in all of the professions. There are women who are mothers as well as lawyers and doctors and bankers. Um, there was a revolution. But I'm talking about the pre-revolution days. Now, Simone de Beauvoir published her book when I was um, in my senior year at college, or maybe the next year, I can't remember. I gobbled it down. I read it. I was enormously moved. I didn't think it had anything at all to do with me. I, mean, I, I just thought if I had been reading about camels in uh, Siberia, it would have had the same relevance to the life I was going to lead. Now, um, why did I write, choose to tell you that? I mean, why am I writing this now? And the answer is um, because there's something happening right now that we don't know about. We're living, breathing our cultural air. Something in it is not quite right, and we don't know what it is. Um, what, I am, what I was trying to do was to create a record. That's the way it was. Um, don't forget that's the way it was. Um, on the other hand, um, things have changed so, so dramatically. The passage, the passage is about my parents, about my mother, um, are um, the entire world of wealthy Jews who lived along Park Avenue in the 1930s and the 1940s and the 50s has changed. <laughs> One of the major things that's changed is servants. Um, I mean, not money. There's still money or lack of money or it's not about your bank account. What has changed drastically is that there's no laundress, uh, who comes. There's no maid and a second maid. There's no cook, live-in cook. Um, there's no nanny, live-in. Uh, there may be an au pair, but there's, that's a very different species than these nannies of the 40s and 50s. In uniform, uh, working six and a half days a week for families. Um, this servant class allowed there to be women who lost their function. And there is no, you know, there's no question that um, uh, servants are a feminist issue, too. And let me explain that. Um, 
my mother had no hands. Think of it this way. You never cook because there's a, somebody in the kitchen cooking, and you never wash because there's a laundress, and you never iron anything, and you don't put the flowers in the vase because there's somebody to do it, and you don't mark it because there's somebody else to do it, and you don't mop the floor. You don't make a birthday cake for your child because there's somebody to do it. You don't change a diaper. You don't bathe a child. What have you done with your hands? What do the hands do? Now, all over America, it seems to me, at the same time that my mother was living this life in Park Avenue, there were other women who would have wished to be philosophers, doctors, whatever. But at the very least, they were making with their hands their own lives. So they had a confidence um, of about something on which they stood. If you remove function, if you don't bake the cupcake and take it to the class so for the child's birthday, what are you really? You're just floating above there. And that's as much what caused my mother to be uh, depressed and anxious and unhappy as the fact that she was in a bad marriage, which could happen anywhere, anytime, any place, uh, and does. Um, this is, this was very specific to these women who shopped, played cards, and spent probably eight hours minimum, eight hours a week at the hairdresser. Um, I mean, it seems unbelievable, but it was so. Um, so the book was written out of some desire to get this down, to put this what now seems unbelievable to people, even my own children don't believe me, on <laughs> record. And I suppose um, there is that other part of it which has to do with, um, um, we're very, I, I, when I use this word in the Jewish community, I am extremely careful of it and I want you to know that I, I am leery of the word. The word I am going to use is witnessing. We save that for, the Holocaust experience. And I in no mean, no way do I wish to compare my childhood or any normal childhood to anything that happened in the Holocaust. But each of us in a certain way are witnesses to our own childhoods. And what the word witness means is the witness stands up and testifies. The witness says, I'm going to tell on you I'm going to get back because I'm going to tell on you. And I am, I do have to say that some of this book, not all of it, but certainly some of the motive of it, um, is my telling on. Uh, it shouldn't have been like that, and I'm telling you now the way it was. Uh, it's not the nicest motive in the world. It's not noble. But on the other hand, I dare say it animates a lot of writing. It's, <laughs> it's interesting, though, that you use the word witness, um, implying a, a kind of a, a pejorative, if you will, or a kind of revenge, whereas some of us might think that what a witness does is report something as he perceived it, as he saw it, with a degree of accuracy that he or she thinks is there. But why bother? Why bother is because you're going to tell on somebody. And, you know, otherwise there's no reason for it. The witness is the person who is, stands, the original meaning in American, in America certainly is, is the witness in the criminal trial. Stands up, says, I saw him do it. He took out the gun and he shot him. Um, but when can you, also be called to defend him. Or, I, or he didn't, exactly. Or, but I saw it, mm -hmm. and I'm here to tell you the truth. And this is the impulse, I think, um, the writing impulse is very much, well, the memoir writing impulse, um, and the fiction impulse as well, actually, is very much um, fueled by this desire to um, make things right by at least but remember, as a child, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you can't change anything in your life. Uh, you cannot make your father come home in time for dinner so your mother won't cry. But what you can do is remember that this happened and someday tell somebody. Um, I think that's, you know, I, 
I, I don't want to speak for all memoirists, but I, I know that's a, a bit of my motive. Would you say that your book then, would you say that there's a factual truthfulness or, or, or would you rather say that there's an emotional truthfulness? Well, there certainly is a factual truthfulness. I mean, there's everything in the book is absolutely true. It's a non-fiction mm -hmm. and I am a professional and I consider that sacred. I mean, there is nothing I would put in that book that I didn't, now, it, wait a minute. It's true according to my vision of the truth. Right. It's right. not true, right. true. It's true as I saw it or true as I remember it or as true, close to the truth as I can, as I can mm -hmm. get. Other members of my family would have other versions and other truths, uh, for sure. But um, yes, it, 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 it's true. Um, otherwise, it would be a fiction. And the truth is I have, I have written a lot of this material into my fiction, in which case I can change it, I can underline it, I can then give it emotional truth. Mm -hmm. Here, the emotional truth it carries comes through, I hope, the factual truth. Um, I'm interested in the word game that you played with yeah. yourself. Um, in fact, the novel ends with, with one of those, taking a long word and seeing what its component parts are and breaking it down into other simple words. And I, I'm not sure exactly, but it struck me that it's got to be some sort of a metaphor for the memoirist art. <laughs> um, somehow breaking down this, this complexity into simpler things that to my mind, often present multiple possibilities. Well, that's a lovely explanation. I mean, I, 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 I really, no, no, it's not that I don't buy it. I think that's, I mean, that seems terrific. The truth is that my mother played that game with me um, when I was a child. And my mother was very interested in uh, board games. I mean, she played Hangman, I'm sure you all know that game with me. Uh, car trips, bus rides, you know, uh, the, to amuse me. Um, and she did this all the time herself. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a big card player and she counted cards. Um, I mean, she really could count cards. And um, she was trying to <coughs> occupy her mind with with stuff. Mm -hmm. And this was part of the stuff. Now, could it in addition mean exactly what you say, why not? I mean, of course it could. Why did it come back to me to use? I mean, it wasn't consciously, I didn't consciously pick that as a metaphor, but um, certainly it's, you know, it's true enough. Maybe it came to my mind to represent um, both the reaching out to my mother, my mother reaching mm -hmm. out to me, and a certain kind of futility, because when you, break all these words down, you get littler words and you don't have anything, you know, all you have is little words. Mm. You don't have a piece. And I think, um, you know, I, it represented to me both, both, it was, well, you use the word wistful. Nobody is ever consciously wistful, um, you know, any more than anybody is ever consciously cute. Um, but it is possible that I was trying to catch some some rue in that device. Comments? Um, you know, we, we really would like your participation, so please feel free, yes. I've not the re read the book, but I'm just, in a way, I'm glad because what are you trying to tell us with the book? Are you just saying this is a, witness, a lifestyle, lifestyle of a certain class, of a certain time that I witnessed growing up there? Or, or is there more to it than you're trying to tell us through the book? What are we supposed to learn from the book? Because certainly today you have women, Jewish women who live on Park Avenue who have maids, who have, who have the laundry done, who have all that. The difference may be that the women today, they find, they, they lose themselves in, in charitable organizations, difference to, with your mother. That's a big difference. Um, there is a Jewish culture, a Jewish women culture, I should say, of Jewish women who um, 
not just the upper class, the richest, but the middle class and lower middle class. It's, it's a cultural thing almost, never to do your own, clean your own house. Uh, coming from my home, I come from a middle to lower middle class home. My mother never cleaned her house. There was always somebody to clean her house. But, excuse me for interrupting you, uh, but m let me explain. Uh, you know, this was just, she just read pieces of it here. Yes. Um, uh, it may have given you uh, the wrong impression. Let, 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 me, let me back up a little bit. Um, Jews came to America and they did very well. And we are all pleased that they did very well. Nobody wants Jews to be poor and hungry and miserable. Uh, however, in the process, there was a, um, a lot was lost. And what was lost was a kind of speedy, accelerated assimilation so that we had a Christmas tree in this house, so that uh, there was no, um, uh, no one had any kind of religious feeling at all. Um, the religious feeling that was in the house came from the German nanny. Um, my brother rebelled, and this is the story that I was after, my brother rebelled against this atmosphere, and when he was bar mitzvahed, became extremely religious. He wouldn't eat in the house, he wouldn't, he wouldn't touch me, uh, he went and studied, and he became very knowledgeable, but it was a, um, it, it was a rather odd thing to have this boy who looked like a yeshiva boy, who had just gotten off the boat, coming down the elevator at a, 1185 Park Avenue. My story is about the Jewish discovery of its loss and its regain, and it's um, the way in which the absence of, and I, I do believe this, I mean, my parents were particular people, I am a particular person, I have a particular story that nobody else has, but I also have a story that's part of the cultural stream. And a lot of people were swimming in that stream. And um, that's what I wanted to point out. Now, I am not teaching. A book doesn't teach. Uh, I am not trying to tell you anything that you don't already know, because I'm sure or that you couldn't tell me. I am trying to uh, write a good book that will engage your heart and mind and will um, hold a piece of our Jewish experience in place, because it will be lost otherwise. Um, I was extremely interested in this book, as you know, in secrets, in things that people are afraid to talk about, in what we do need to talk about. Um, I'm opposed to secrets. Uh, therefore, um, I found it necessary to write this book. Um, it is not about, I am not judging people who clean their houses or don't clean their houses. That's not, that's not the point. The point is that one needs to function in the world in such a way as to feel competent um, and to feel your uh, effect on the space around you. Now, you don't have to clean a toilet in order to feel that, but you do have to do something. And when women became uh, when women were in the shtetl, Jewish women were in the shtetl, they worked all the time. They worked in the marketplace, they worked at home, they worked th as much or more as men. They didn't study as much, but they worked as much. Um, when they came here and the men were able to have what, what we will call, uh, you know, to support their wives, to support their daughters, we had a cultural shift and these women suddenly did not have a sphere of confidence. And um, it makes me particularly, you know, upset. We all, you know, we all know that the Jewish mother jokes were, you know, a kind of cruel and unnecessary attack on Jewish women. The Jewish princess jokes are cruel attacks on our daughters. What grain of truth is there is that if women have nothing to do but to be decorative objects, um, they fall apart inside. And their men fall apart inside. And the culture falls apart. And that's what I was writing about. Yes? Um, first, let me say that I love the book. I found the words in your story riveting. Thank you. Um, this is a little difficult to ask, but I couldn't forget it while reading it or as you were talking. As a witness to your father's cruelty, 
How do I remember the good stuff about my father? There seemed to be so much cruelty. Uh, did I write about the good stuff? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, what I read, where I heard, where was the affection. Ah, now, you know, a, a lot of people have, have asked me why I kept on having a relationship with him. Why did I keep persisting? And I think the answer is, you know, is not personal particularly. I think the children tend to love their parents no matter who they are. And I think children keep wanting. And even though they know that this is a dry stone, they keep trying to get something from it. And, um, you know, I, there's no question that I persisted um, long after, you know, good sense might have told you, you know, listen, don't call him again, you know, don't ask him to come over and visit the kids, he's not coming, you know, good sense would tell you not to. But you persist out of, you know, a kind of um, uh, denial, hope, uh, attachment, need, um, and it takes a long, long time. I mean, I am now in my 60s, and I really now am you know, I now have walked away. But did I walk away in my 40s? No, I didn't. And um, this is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think this is unusual. I think it's about the nature of child's attachment to their parent. But it seems to me that you pursued um, the relationship with your brother also, despite a number of obstacles. Well, that's true. I mean, my brother also, uh, however, I mean, my brother was a wonderful linguist. He was a wonderful humorist. He, um, I enjoyed those jokes. He wasn't overly fond of me, but, um, <laughs> you know, he, uh, I admired him. Um, he was my brother. Um, you know, my children say to me constantly, why did you keep asking him to come to dinner? But I, you know, I, the, this is, you know, you, you become attached to what you have. And he is what I had. There's an underlying sense of um, guilt, I would call it, uh, perhaps because he, he really lived a very sad <laughs> life and, and a very tragic one. Um, and I, I keep feeling, as I read this, that, that somewhere the little girl, Anne, keeps thinking, I should have acted differently towards him and I could have spared him. Well, you know, that's, that's probably true. Um, first of all, I was born on Christmas Day. It gives you a terrible sense of what you ought to do in this world. <laughs> um, but, um, of course, you know, there's, 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 there's guilt, there's, um, um, I mean, you know, he, my brother lived a tragic life in one way and in another way he didn't. He had a wife and a son and he had science and he had um, books he loved and he had music he adored. And I, I mean, there are a lot of people who lived, Very you know, worse. far worse lives. I, I don't, you know, it isn't, it isn't that. It's that. Um, you know, he, he was, he struggled, and in a way struggled better than I did, to find meaning. I mean, when, when he was studying in yeshivas up in the Bronx, um, you know, I was, I was trying to get myself invited to prep schools for dances. Um, you know, he, he knew many, many things that I did not know or came to late, for which I, I respected him. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Well, I think that he he understood. He he became very interested in music. I mean, we had piano lessons, like you know, people are supposed to have little kids have piano lessons. I happen to be tone deaf, um, and he happens to have a perfect pitch. So he became, uh, you know, he became very serious about the piano and very serious about classical music. And um, then he became very serious about learning languages, Hebrew, Italian, French, Arabic, Yiddish. Um, and then he became very serious about literature. Um, Proust, European, Thomas Mann, European literature. And then he became very serious about science. Um, during that, a lot of that time, I was behaving 
like a good girl of that world doing exactly what I should have done. And it's just a wonder that at some point, you know, I decided, I mean, something happened and I went <laughs> off in another direction. But um, he was, a, he understood very early that there was not enough culture to nourish a fly in that household and that he was going to have to make his own culture. And I respect him for that. Oh. You have uh, In the book? No. No. In the New York Times, you wrote a piece. I think it's probably the New York Observer. Observer. Oh, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to ask you how your children uh, felt about the book, um, particularly the daughter who was from your first marriage, whether it helped her understand you, forgive you, or bring you closer. <laughs> I, I don't know. You'd have to ask her. I, I, my own feeling about that is that if my children have to know me through my books, we're in very bad trouble. Um, you know, I don't think that's how they know me. Um, the other part of this is that I've been writing this material over, for so long in different forms. Um, when I was um, divorced, I was 27. And I immediately wrote my first book, which was about this. Um, now, at that point, I didn't understand what it, I did not know what it meant. Um, but I knew that I was angry at something. And I wrote the story, actually, of my mother's death, because I thought I was angry at the cancer that killed her. Um, which, I mean, I was, but that wasn't all. Um, I wrote my first book. Most of the members of my family stopped speaking to me at that point, at that moment, um, which is perfectly understandable. If I were them, I would have stopped speaking to me too. Um, I have no, you know, I have no complaint. Um, you write this book, you know, it makes them mad, so it makes them mad. Um, I've been, and my children have been reading me all these years, so I, I don't think there's any, you know, there, I don't think there was any surprise in it. I think the surprise, um, the surprise always comes for me, because each time I touch this material, I take it a little bit further and I see something I didn't see before. Um, uh, I'd like to ask you a question about psychoanalysis, which of course was part of the zeitgeist, and mm. certainly a very, played a very large role in your family's life. Your mother was in analysis, uh, your brother all of his life. Um, would you like to comment on its role in your family? Mm. It's, it's, um, is this in some way a critique of it? Uh, um, how do you think no. about it? I'm married to a psychoanalyst. Um, I am an enormous, and my stepdaughter is a psychoanalyst. Um, and I, you know, I certainly feel that it was, you know, one of the most, the next to, well, right alongside of my college education, um, my own analysis, um, you know, is, is uh, what makes me who I am today, um, for sure. Um, however, Psychoanalysis is um, uh, is not it is not a cure all. It is not a culture. It is not a substitute for culture. It isn't a substitute for a place in this world. It doesn't give you a place in this world. It may make it possible for you to find a place, but in and of itself, it isn't a place. So, I I, I mean, my feeling about um, I use psychoanalysis. All, in almost everything I write, because it gives me a voice to, from the outside to look at, you know, comment. I can comment from the outside on what's going on. Um, but, um, you know, do I, um, I don't think it saved my mother. It may have saved my brother. Um, I think, in fact, I probably think it did, because I think that 
um, there's a scene in this book, for those of you who haven't read it, in which he believes he's being poisoned by my mother. Yeah. Now, actually, um, that's a fairly serious thing. I mean, I, you know, it, it sounds like that is not something a child is going to grow out. You know, that's, that's not, it's not even like bedwetting. I mean, it's a really serious thing to be happening. And I think that um, he grew up to be a man who functioned, who contributed, um, who managed his life in all ways. Um, and I, that may have been, psychoanalysis may very well have made that possible. I mean, we don't, you know, you never know about the rodent not taken. I mean, if my family had moved to uh, South Dakota and we had started to raise sheep, would he have been all right too? Probably, but I mean, you know, I, I, as best I can tell, it was psychoanalysis so it's, it's, it's really a, a tool for living. I, I think it. I think no. I think it's a tool for thinking. For thinking um, is the way I would describe it. Um, that um, the idea that there is an unconscious that affects us all the time. Um, that we are filled with dark thoughts as well as deep needs, and that we aren't always aware of what we're. <coughs> Of, our, of either our dark thoughts or our needs is one that influences the way I understand the world. Um, it influences the way I understand politics. It influences, um, it influences everything. Um, and it, you know, it's more nuanced than I just gave you in two sentences, but, sure. but that's essentially um, um, what I believe, and I think that you know, nobody knows at this moment, for economic reasons, whether there'll be psychoanalysts in 50 years or not. There may not be practicing psychoanalysts, but there will be psychoanalytic thinkers for sure, and there will be psychoanalytic critics for sure. And um, precisely because it influences, it opens many things up. Yes. Oh, I'm delighted. If I recall, in um, Park Avenue, my feelings were that you felt very badly for your mother, but you truly loved your father and constantly looked for his, appro his attention and his approval and so forth. I don't remember exactly, uh, but at the time, after your mother passed away, did you miss your mother? And second part <laughs> is, did you truly love your father or were you just searching for the attention and the approval. Uh, let me let me see let me see what I can do with this. My my, my first thought is that um, I don't I don't know why I'm sitting here thinking who is she talking about? Um, you know, and and I know it must be me, but I'm not quite clear. Uh, let me try to explain this. Of course, I loved my mother. Um, however, she was in a state of great grief all of her life. Her expectations for me were that, were that I should follow her into her life. Um, she wanted me to marry you know, any number of boys from the dancing school I had gone to. Um, she wanted the same life for me that she had had. Now, and she knew it was not a good life, but she still wanted the same life. Um, I needed to be someone else. I needed to find another way. Um, she died early in my life. Um, all of her friends kept coming up to me at the funeral and saying, oh, it's so sorry that Blanche died so young. And I, who was 27 at the time, kept thinking, young? You know, whatever do you mean? <laughs> um, but in fact, of course she died young. Uh, she died young, and it was I was still young. Um, but um, of course I missed her. But I also was able to do things that I might not have been able to do had she been um, alive. Um, there, which is, you know, a terrible truth. There's a pull between a mother and daughter, and particularly when it's not working well, the attachment isn't all good. 
And so that in a certain sense, it was awful, but it was, you know, it, it, it was freeing. Um, you know, and both things are, both things are true. As to the fact that I loved my father, I already discussed this. I, I did not love him out of a sense of tenderness towards him or his tenderness towards me. Um, a male is a very important figure in a house. A male is, uh, for a, a little girl, uh, this, was, um, this was who must love me. If he doesn't love me, which he did not, um, what do I do then? What do I do about that? And all my childhood I made, so I created solutions for that. Um, and that is, um, look, you know, during this time that I'm writing about, now we have to keep this in proportion. Children all over this world were starving, were being killed, were without food, without houses, without medical care, without their parents. I mean, terrible things were happening in this world. I'm sitting on Park Avenue um, in some of the prettiest dresses you ever saw, um, certainly fed, certainly clothed, educated, and not only that, by my mother, loved. Um, and also tolerated by nannies. Um, nothing is really wrong in the scale of things. But if you close in into our emotional life, which is what writers do, I mean, this is my material. You don't want me to write a, a, a story of being a little girl in Vienna as a Nazis marched, and you have somebody else to do that. Uh, you want from me my place where I was, and this is what happened in this place. And that's all that I can write about with this level of authenticity. Um, that's. Uh, I'd like to read another passage and um, switch topics a bit. Delusion, illusion, magic rights. I would have no more of it. I didn't mind that the sky above my head was empty. I was persuaded, even impressed by my argument against the existence of God, with its coda against the goodness of God. Still, on the way home, in the warm air, with the heat of the day making my legs prickle in the beige stockings I was wearing, attached to a tight girdle that pinched my middle and left indentations in my skin, I found myself with tears on my face. I was angry at somebody. Was it the God I no longer believed in? or the Jews who were gathering in the synagogue without me? Was my heart already hardened against God by my father? Or was I by nature a skeptic, a child of the Enlightenment? Or was I simply angry at fathers, including God the Father? The blank you actually write. Your experience with Judaism as a youngster was not extensive, but obviously at age 12, I think this was, uh, you rebelled against what you consider to be an unjust God. Well, I remember I happened to have been 12 as the Margaret Burke White pictures of Auschwitz were coming through on Life magazine. Um, you know, other people were 14, 16, 5, you know, whatever. It affected everybody. And there was no way that your relationship with God would be the same after those pictures as it was before. Um, you know, that's, that's for sure. Um, second of all, uh, I t I, in the book, I believe, I, I'm sure that I tell the story that my best friend's father was a orthopedist who devoted his time to helping, um, uh, to working in uh, a hospital up in Harlem. Um, he died suddenly, her father. And I was totally shocked that my father, who wanted nothing but to have more money, was living, and her father, who was a good man, had died. <coughs> At which point I said, "This, there can be no justice." Now, I mean, you know, somebody else has a sister who dies or falls off a horse, or you know, I mean, any number of things happen that cause faith to become in question, along with history. Um, the um, 
The other thing that happened, which I don't believe is in this book, is that I went to, I, we, were, we attended the Park Avenue Synagogue, which at that time was a, um, a conservative moving towards reform. Uh, so we attended Sunday school. And um, I was uh, in a, a class, and uh, it was Jewish history class, and I happened to be very passionate about history. So I read everything. And I happened to be somebody who kept raising their hand. I raised my hand, I raised my hand, I knew everything. And I, at one point the teacher said to me, keep your hand down, we need to hear from the boys. <laughs> and I walked out and I never went back. Um, now, um, did I know that this was a feminist response? No, didn't know that it was such a thing as feminism. I was just personally offended. Um, and. The, the choice of sitting there and keeping my hand down was not possible for me. Um, now, um, that's an old story. I mean, that is not what's happening today in any of our, in any of our educational institutions. And, you know, the, what is the point of, of, of bringing it up? It's explaining, you know, if you maltreat, if you disenfranchise, if you cut off from your Jewish center, 50% of your population, you're going to lose a lot. I mean, that's, you know, that's for sure. Um, and I'm very, you know, it, it is very gratifying to see the reversal today. Well, one chapter is entitled, I think it's wonderful, A Whirlwind Without a Voice, A Bush With Nothing to Say, Godless on Park Avenue. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in your mind then, as a youngster growing up. And then, of course, there are two people. There are two points of view. Then there's you <laughs> writing it now. What do you think is the connection between that, that godlessness and Park Avenue? Well, I don't think uh, materialism and consumerism that um, swept over many Jewish communities in many different places all over America um, interfered with um, a, um, a holiness that we might have otherwise had. I mean, I do believe that. I think that um, that it, you know, if you are um, if you are devoting your life to making to making a lot of money, and if money becomes the main thing in your life, um, um, I think, you know, <coughs> study, art, <coughs> mind, music, love, begin to take secondary, third place to that. And it's dangerous. And I think that we lived for a long time um, I think that the descriptions that we had from, let's take Philip Roth, you can be mad at him for one reason or another, but what you see in his country is godlessness. Um, now, I, I'm not, I, I, I want to be clear here. Uh, to, today, I don't, I'm not a particularly exactly a believer. Um, it's not that I, you know, it isn't that I've had some great religious return. Um, it, it's that I understand the necessity for filling your life with things that are of culture. And our Jewish culture includes religion, is built around religion. And to live without it um, is to be impoverished. Do you think that things have changed uh, to any extent in our affluent Jewish milieu? Do I think they have changed? Well, I think that, you know, I think everybody knows what I just said now. I mean, I think, you know, when I started to say it, it was relatively fresh. But at this point, I mean, everybody, everybody knows why are they constantly pushing for day schools? Why are they raising money for day schools? Why are they, I mean, everybody knows that the rate of assimilation is terribly high, the rate of intermarriage is high, and that the way to counteract it is through education, uh, through Jewish connection. Um, and that, you know, that isn't through buying a better, more silvered um, menorah, it's through 
learning and connection to the tradition. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I think it's changed. I mean, I, I think all over there's an intensification of Jewish culture um, because people realize that you can't, you can't do with nothing um, and expect to hold on to a community. Um, not to mention the fact that I, I don't think it's good for individual souls to be, um, to be, to have their inner landscapes consist of what's on the TV. Um, you know, I really don't. Um, sorry. That's, that's obviously a very interesting um, <clears throat> theme in Loving Kindness, mm -hmm. which I think is a wonderful, wonderful novel. Thank you. Um, but, um, Anyone want to add anything on this subject? I'm curious um, how and why you became a, a writer. Um, I did read the book, mm -hmm. and I, you, you mentioned that you wrote your first book right after your first divorce. And, or I shouldn't say your first divorce, after your divorce. And <laughs> you, were married to, you were married to a writer who often had writer's block. Did you, is there a, like a connection there that you were married to a writer and, and sort of thought that you you were a writer also, or did that come later? Uh, the way it worked is that when I was in first grade, I was standing outside of the classroom with a group of little girls, and we were talking about what we were going to be when we grew up. And one of them was going to be a teacher, and one of them was going to be a nurse. And one of them said she didn't know what she wanted to be. And I looked at her and I said, there must be something wrong with you. Everybody knows what they want to be. I want to be a writer. <laughs> now, what happened um, between age seven and age 18 when I met my first husband was that um, I grew up and believed that the, way, the only way I was going to be able to do this thing was to be married to it. Um, that it didn't occur to me, to, in the same way, the, the parallel, the story you heard about waiting for the person to come to pick me up in the museum, the Israeli soldier, you know, it seems crazy now. I mean, I hear that and I think, how is that possible? It was possible. Um, and it was possible because um, agency seemed to be male and passivity seemed to be female. And um, it just seemed to me that, you know, what I needed to do was to be somebody's muse. Um, when I was divorced, my mother died within a month. I mean, I was divorced a month after my mother died. Um, it, it, what, there I was. What was I? Well, I was a writer. I mean, that's all I'd ever been. And so that's when I started started to write. Um, you know, I was just very lucky that I wasn't terrible at it. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know what exactly I would have done next. Um, How did you go about writing the memoir? The memoir. I started the... I was just talking about that this morning with um, my daughter, who's a novelist. And she's starting her second novel. She, you know, all the beginning trouble, when you start, it's always trouble. And, you know, it's just like when you were afraid and you were in the swimming pool and you had to let go of the side and just paddle over to the other side. There's no other way to do it. At some point, you let go and you move forward. And um, that's what happened with this memoir. I started it. I decided to do it. I had been, my brother had just died as, you know, really within a year. And I wanted to write, um, I wanted to write his story. And mm -hmm. I just began. And so, so your brother was actually the, the initial impetus? Uh, probably, yes. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, <clears throat> and it is really his story. I mean, did, did you have to do any kind of, I, I guess research is not an appropriate word, but did it all come from yeah. the well within you? Oh, all of it. All of it? All of it. Um, um, 
people ask me how, now, I mean, there's some things. People ask me, how can I remember the color of the dining room drapes, for example? <laughs> um, you know, well, actually, I, that I'm not absolutely sure. I remember some of it. I remember the color of the rug. I remember the color of the dining room table. I think I remember the color of the dining room drapes, but I'm a novelist. So when I need drapes of a color, I mean, <laughs> you know, there they are. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I wouldn't swear to every, you know, those kinds of details, absolutely. Uh, I need a blanket uh, in my mind. I put flowers on the, bl on the blanket or stripes on the upholstery. I'm not 100% sure of that. But, um, you know, it had to have something on it. Uh, you know, and if it wasn't red, it was blue. I mean, you know, it, it's, uh, you, you use, and certainly I remember, emotionally, I remember everything. And I also remember, um, um, I mean, everybody, I, I, everybody, if you sat down to write your story, would remember all of the important things. Um, well, I think that sometimes the things that I remember from my childhood may be things that I don't remember, but that I subsequently heard from my parents or in the retellings. And I would have a very hard time, I think, distinguishing. Um, well, that's really true only of very early memories. I mean, the ones after you're six or seven, you know, should be your own memories. And then there's the screen memory, I mean, which is, um, you know, where you, you remember something, but you've kaleidoscoped everything all together, and it's not, it never really happened that way. But it, it, it encoded in that screen memory is a message of something really important about you mm -hmm. that you really feel or know. Um, but when you write, part of it is that you, you know, somehow or other you lose you lose connection. I mean, when I'm writing, one day my husband came in with some groceries, and he came in behind me and he dropped the groceries down on the floor. And I got, I screamed like I have never screamed in my life. There was a, there was somebody in my, you know, it was as if I was being attacked by a stranger in my house. I was so frightened. And what it was is that I was just so deep into myself that to have him, you know, come in that way and cut into this place that I was so far away was just overwhelming. And, um, you know, I thought it was just my, my same old husband, you know, it was nothing terrifying. But where I was was very far away. And it's in that space that you remember everything. Do you think that the, the, um, the process of writing a novel, for example, is a similar experience? Oh, it's or how exactly is it the same experience. Is it? Exactly the same experience. The only thing is you have to work a little harder because you don't have the, um, I mean, I was writing the story of my brother. Um, in order to do it, I had to tell something about myself. The book focuses as little on me as I possibly could um, because I didn't want to, you know, that's not so interesting to me. So I, I really had to tell, I had to tell about the family and the place, and you know, I had to, and I know the events that were leading up to what it was I wanted to tell. Um, if I'm writing a novel, I usually have an idea where it's ending. I have an idea who, how they're getting there, but there's this vast middle where I have to invent, and it's much harder work. But it's the same work. And once you're there, I mean, if you're inventing a, if you're inventing a scene, if seen in. Um, a yeshiva in Jerusalem where I've never been. Um, you know, what am I going to do? I just invented, right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. What was your brother's wife's reaction? My brother's wife, to what? To the book? Well, I think that, you know, she is a very private person and certainly entitled to her privacy, which is why there was no name. Um, in the book. Um, she was upset and disturbed, as she has every right to be. Um, on the other hand, it's my story, too. Um, I feel sorry that she was upset, but um, I feel that um, 
I believe that the act of talking about the things that have gone on, do go on, and will go on among us is a, um, is a decent thing to do, uh, not an indecent thing to do. So um, that's why I was able to write the book. Um, you know, it would, it would have certainly made me happier had she been thrilled to see it, but I can well understand why she would not be. Um. Yes? Do you think you would have been able to write with the degree of candor that you did about your brother and your mother if they were still alive, or were you able to do it only after they passed away? Well. I don't think I would have done it while they were alive, um, because um, it would have been, my own feelings would, would have been so entangled, I wouldn't have been able to sort out, among other things. Besides which, I mean, I'm ruthless, but I'm, there are limits, you know, <laughs> there, there are, I'm, I mean, writers are pretty ruthless, you know, we, we, we use what's in our lives, we use people in front of us, we use, um, we chew it up, we spit it out, but, you know, there are certain boundaries. I mean, I, I you know, I don't, um, some level of protectiveness you have to have. Um, and um, in this case, in the case of this book, what I wanted to write about was my brother's, I mean, it stemmed from my brother's death. So it wouldn't have been there had he not been dying. Yes. Being two children from the same household, um, have you ever thought about if your brother had written a book similar, mm -hmm. <coughs> what his perspective would have been on the whole thing? Well, I, I mean, you know, of course he would have had a somewhat different perspective. I mean, I don't think he would have had a different perspective about our parents. I don't think he would have had a culturally different, I mean, I think we were in complete agreement as to what was going on, what had gone on in that house. You oh, in many ways, yes, and in many times, and I, I mean, I'm sure of that. Um, he would have, um, he would have seen himself, I'm sure, as um, uh, he would have seen himself more beautifully than I saw him, um, and I see myself more beautifully than he would have seen me, um, and that you know, uh, that's all I really know about this. I don't know what he would have. I really don't know what he would have seen. Um, I think, if the truth. Truthfully, I think he had great scorn for me because I'm not particularly good at math, and I'm too sloppy to be a scientist, and I'm not a linguist because I don't have the ear that he had. And I think he felt enormously um, superior. I also don't play chess well. Um, I think he felt enormously superior, and with some justification. I mean, all those, all the, all those things are, are perfectly true. Um, but there it is. Um, yes. Did you follow in the religion? Uh, he did not follow in the religion. Um, he gave it up when he uh, was in college, though he um, he kept his Yiddish accent, um, and he kept um, his Yiddish jokes. And um, he kept his knowledge, um, and he loved the language, Hebrew language. Um, and, um, and he kept his interest in things Jewish, um, history, politics. Um, so the answer is, you know, my own feeling is, at the end of the book, I, I don't know if you've read the book, but at the end of the book, he doesn't want any Hebrew on his coffin. He insists that we remove, he f insists that we remove it because he's, 
very angry at the God who would have created AIDS. Um, my feeling is that that is an enormously religious act. Um, if you are indifferent to religion, you certainly don't care whether they, you know, there's some words rolled on your coffin or not. You don't care if they say a prayer at your gravesite because, you, you know, what do they do it's for them? Let them do it if they want to do it. If you forbid them to do it, and if you forbid any sound of Hebrew, the Hebrew that you loved so much, that was so much a part of your life, anywhere near you, that is a religious act. Now, what kind of a religious act? Um, um, you know, I don't know. Is it a fruitful religious act in that it, is it communicable to the next generation? Maybe not. But it is surely, um, it is surely part of a dialogue with God. I will not speak to you is part of a dialogue. To ask a very prosaic question, which uh, mm -hmm. um, I wondered about, how did the Philip Van Jusen Company get its name? Uh, well, um, my, my family's name was Phillips. Mm -hmm. And I, if I have the story right, there was somebody named Van Heusen who invented the soft collar. And up to that point, men had all these, you know, these hard uh -huh. collars that they had to remove. And that Van Heusen invented the soft collar and somehow got connected with my grandfather who had a loft at that point making shirts. And they, um, they got together and made these soft collar shirts. And when they had about 40 people in the loft making the soft collar shirts, my grandfather bought out Van Heusen. Um, so that's at least and there was a Jones in there somewhere at some <laughs> point, but I, I, don't, I don't quite know what the business history uh -huh. Uh -huh. was. All, right. All possibilities are not genuine possibilities. We are what we are, like it or not. Mm -hmm. What do you think? <clears throat> Sounds true to me. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. You said it. I said it, OK. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think. Um, I suppose in some way I was, you know, I'm always fighting against the romantic, you know, the romantic mm -hmm. in me that says, you know, everything is possible, everything good will happen, um, we, can we can change anything. And, you know, of course, uh, there is a little reality out there that pulls you up short. Uh, well, you were very much taken, I think, with... Uh, with America and everything that it represented, everything it stood for, and, and Emerson and Thoreau, when you speak about that frequently, and the New England churches and the steeples. And is that part of that romantic notion that you had of? Well, I don't know whether it's part of it. I mean, we, you can't say that, you know, admiring the um, American culture is romantic. I mean, after all, most Americans do admire the American culture and feel very much a part of it. And I think even Jews who live, uh, who have an alternate season, if you will, uh, and, uh, you know, who celebrate Hanukkah at Christmas, who celebrate uh, Passover at Easter, I mean, even so, we are intellectually um, very much a part of the culture. And we go to school and we learn we are part of the Enlightenment culture. Um, you know, you, you, we're not just we're not just Jews in this country. We're Jews and Americans. Um, now, what is true is that when I was a child, the desire to be a part of America, which was my greenhorn father's, you know, uh, drive, great drive, was um, was such that I devalued things that were Jewish, and I overvalued things that were American. At this point in my life, I very much va I mean, I value Amer Emerson, I value Thoreau, I value uh, Herman Melville, I value Walt Whitman, um, which doesn't mean that I don't love Babel and Singer and Bialik and uh, what makes up our the landscape of our culture as I now know it. Um, there's room for both, I think. So that you no longer feel, I mean, am I right in saying that as you were growing up there was ambivalence, but that you've worked your way through it? As I was growing up there was, um, 
never mind ambivalence, there was a, a strong desire to be, I mean, I went to a school where there were um, very few Jewish girls and where the, the, those who were in the school were from very fine families who had been here for centuries. And um, their mothers were very plain. Their mothers had, you know, Oxford shoes on, and their mothers volunteered at Planned Parenthood. And their mothers were, wore very little makeup. And my mother had a huge fur coat, and every time she walked, all the gold jewelry tinkled. And, um, and I was embarrassed of her. I was in, because she was not like the other mothers, who seemed to me to be more beautiful, more American. Now, that was a 13-year-old's view, a 14-year-old's view. Um, you know, today, I wouldn't buy that. Today, I would say to myself, the woman who was sent her daughter to a dancing class that I would not have been allowed to go to had something very wrong with her soul. And I don't care what she had on her outside, but I don't think it's very beautiful. Um, you know, I, now I would feel differently about that. But growing up, that was the surrounding culture. Um, <laughs> How have your children been able to uh, have a different experience than yours? How have they? Well, because times changed. I mean, they, they wouldn't think of having this. You know, it isn't the same. The world isn't the same. Jews are much more accepted in the world now than they were then. Um, uh, the school, this very same school we're talking about, had a Jewish head when they went there. Um, I mean, it's a very different. It's a very, very different world. However, I mean, just to go back to that. Um, Think of Philip Roth and Saul Bellow. Um, why were they constantly falling in love? Why was this whole generation of Jewish men, intellectuals, all falling in love with non-Jewish women, one after another? Why did they think that was so beautiful? It was a symbol for. It was a symbol for America. I'm sure they still do. It was a symbol. It was a symbol for America. Right? To be an American. That's what they wanted, was to, to have, to possess the Corn Belt, to possess the Gentile world, to conquer it and take it to bed. Um, and that was where glamour and beauty and romance and sex lay, not in the, not in the Jewish sister of their friend whom they didn't want to have anything to do with. And you, you know, we have, we have that documented um, cold. I mean, that's the way it was. So that, you know, we were living through a period, now that's over too. We are living through a period of time then, let's say 1945 through 1970, 65, where um, what seemed to be valuable was not within the Jewish world, but was without. Um, I think it was a mistake, but um, that doesn't mean it didn't happen or it wasn't so. Um, and intermarriage is still happening, but and obviously still, for, I don't for think different it's, reasons. I don't think it's happening. That, I don't think it's suggesting? happening. No, I don't think it's happening for the same reasons. I mean, I think it's happening now because there's uh, simply um, not a lot of Jewish culture to hold the Jewish kids in, and there's a great free-for-all out there, you know, that, that, I mean, you meet, who you meet, and the, you know, it, it's just, the world is open, and, and I think that's different. The world wasn't so open. I mean, it was a big deal for Philip Roth to get this girl. It wasn't so easy, and once he had it, 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 it just, it was different. Now, I just don't think, I think there are other social forces at work, but, um, it's not the, It's not at all the same thing, and not only that, but the um, Jewish boy feels American. He doesn't feel un-American. Philip Roth was worried about being American. He was worried all the time that you know there was something uh, that he wasn't really a part of it. You know that he was somehow an alien. Um, not you know not tr not true now. Um, 
we truly have nothing to prove as Jews and as Americans? Nothing? Well, I don't know whether that's, I mean, that, that's probably, um, <laughs> I don't quite believe that. Uh, but what I, first of all, you know, you never know that just because, just because there isn't a great horrible anti-Semitism out there today doesn't mean there won't be one in 15 years. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Um, and we certainly have a lot to prove in that we have to prove that we can stay alive as a community. We have to make the next generation. I mean, that, that we have to prove. Um, what we don't have to prove is that, um, you know, we can do well on standardized tests. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Uh, tell me about redemption. That's the last word of your memoir. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, I suppose I believe that the redemption comes in the next generation. The redemption is undoing. The redemption is making the world better in some way so that the next generation experiences it differently. Now, they have their own problems and they have their own troubles, but I think they're different troubles. And I think they're lesser troubles. And I think there has been improvement. Um, redemption is a very huge word. I mean, it implies, you know, everything is totally all right. But, um, um, Redemption is what I would yearn for. It is what I would wish. Um, what I will get is, you know, sort of perhaps a, a modest improvement. And that's because, not because I'm some peculiar person, but because I'm simply a human being. Um. And I think, thank you so much. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you very much. A real pleasure. A pleasure to do this with you. Thanks for listening. For more information on the 92nd Street Y New York and all of our programs, please visit us at 92ny.org.